those who don't know me, I see new faces. I'm Lisa Martin. I'm the program manager here. And we're excited to have you and very excited about uh, this lecture series with David. Um, and if you didn't grab the full, there's some sheets out front that have a full schedule on them and with all the topics, so please do take one with you. Put it up on the fridge so that you can remember when it's coming, but I believe it's always the third Sunday of each month. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Oliver from Medicine Dan, uh, formerly of MIT and Stanford or Stanford, mm -hmm. right? Well, um, I would like to offer a kind of perspective, a way of having a frame of reference, a way to kind of get grounded a little bit in uh, dealing with the wild time that Lisa spoke of. And my perspective is going to rely a lot on uh, what science can illuminate about what's going on. And that, of course, is not going to be sufficient to answer all questions. And in fact, nobody can answer all the questions. What I think I can do is tell a story about where we are right now, who we are right now, and how we got here. It's not a complete story but it is got a lot of pieces that do hold together. But I cannot tell where we're going, nor can anybody, except maybe in some very small, short guesses about the future. So uh, where did we come from? Now, I'm just talking about the physical nature of where we came from. You can put your own interpretation on uh, how you want to embellish that. But this is, a, this is a picture that was taken with the Hubble telescope. It's as deep and as far back into the universe as anybody has ever seen. This is very old light that is coming from only about 600 million years after the Big Bang. Now you say 600 million years, that's huge. Well, the universe is about 14 billion years old, and the Earth is about 4 billion years old. So 700 million is pretty fast, or pretty short. But 700 million is enough years for hydrogen and helium to start fusing, for stars to start forming and start burning, and even to go through a cycle that involves supernovas. So, uh, you're seeing a lot of stuff here that's sitting in front of the far background, but it's like the most distant objects you can barely see are the earliest stars, and they date from the earliest time of the universe. Um, this is our home. We are of the universe, and the universe is in us in some fundamental way. So we should feel at home in the universe. Now here is something that I don't think most people appreciate. Uh, the universe is dynamic. Now of course you know that time is always moving and we're all getting older and so on. But there is an unstoppable forward motion of time. And as far as we know, even though you can think about time going around in a circle and civilizations repeating, those are all imaginative constructions. There is no evidence of any such thing. That doesn't mean it couldn't possibly be. We don't have every bit of evidence there is. But there is no physical evidence for such a picture. It's really much more, I think, kind of exciting and truly dynamic in that this has never happened before. It has never been done before. It has never occurred before. And what's coming next will also be new if we have any uh, indication of, of how that will be from the past. So there's an unstoppable forward motion of time and evolutionary change. When, if there's time, the reason we know there's time is because things change. If nothing changed, we have no concept of time. T 
time is really a measure of motion. The thing that gives us time is motion, movement, change, something changed. So something changes. And that Big Bang began some change that developed into gases and stars, and the stars exploded and created heavy elements, and they condensed, and the world is on a roll. So what is evolution? Well, biologically, first of all, evolution is much bigger than life. Evolution is part of what that Big Bang is doing. Evolution is part of gases condensing, stars forming, exploding, heavy particles forming again and condensing, making planets and star systems coming after the very first ones and, and then recycling that material and making a new one. So in life, quantum waves in DNA induce random mutations. There's no way to predict what's going to happen in a mutation. And there always are a number of random mutations, a small number, but always a, a number of random mutations. And the random mutations change the organism that that DNA belongs to. So that organism is going to be different. And when that organism goes into life, and interacts with the environment and other organisms, it's not going to be the same. Some of them will not survive and they'll die, and others will go on to live and become the next set of genes and the next set of DNA for the next generation. That's what evolution is about. Random mutation and then natural selection as all of these organisms work it out. Evolution involves both law and freedom. There are laws of physics that govern that DNA molecule. It's not a completely wide open thing. But there is part of that structure that is free. It can't be nailed down. So it's this combination, this twofold combination of some restraint, some constraints, that's the law, and yet there's something that's free. There's something that can't be predicted of what will happen. So evolution as art is lawful and art is free. The greatest art has these two characteristics. And evolution as art explores, tinkers, experiments, and corrects. And uh, it's my uh, conviction that evolution is divine art of the highest order. It is truly something that one can bow one's head and say, this is quite amazing. So, we're on this roll. We're part of this evolutionary universe. The um, remnants of stars that have exploded and gases that have come along with them condense into a spiral disk. They do this many, many times over and make solar systems uh, with planets revolving around stars, and we live in such a solar system. Uh, and we live on this planet Earth. And on this planet Earth, for four billion years, life has been growing and changing mostly for the last two and a half billion or two billion years. Only single cell organisms existed for a very long period. And this is just a portrait of the, of the dynamic unfolding of life, plants, fungi, uh, and, the, and the different orders. And one of them is the order of mammals. And up here are primates. And out here are human beings. But we are part of a vast community of life. And we should appreciate the vast community of which we are a part. And here is our particular niche of primate evolution, starting about 60 million years ago, where the primates broke off and we have several kinds of primates that a lot of you are probably sure familiar with. 
old and new world monkeys, prosimians, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and human beings. And here's one of our early primate human beings, Australopithecus. Now, about a million years ago, uh, human beings departed from the last primate species. And so we have a lot of relatives who are no longer with us, like the Neanderthals, but they are definitely in the fossil record. And one of the remarkable discoveries that uh, is part of what I call the age of discovery is what we have learned by digging things up. There are times when I think it's kind of crazy that we have to learn things by digging them up. But nobody tells us. We are not born with a understanding that's written into our genome that comes with us and it's in our brain. We say, well, yes, of course we know. We know all about this. We didn't. We had to gain it by very hard work, by digging things up. There are times when I think it kind of amazes me that that's the way it works. Now, genetic evolution, which is what I was talking about, the quantum waves on the molecules of DNA, is actually a very slow process. It takes a long time to get a major change on the scale of thousands to millions of years. But genetic evolution evolved the human brain and mind over about a million years. And just to show you how dramatic that is, this is a picture of the brain size. So here is the brain size in cubic centimeters. So you can see that this is bigger and bigger. And across here is the average body weight of a bunch of primates. So here's the chimpanzee, here's uh, the orangutan, here's the gorilla. And these are early uh, precursors to Homo sapiens that are in our line, but they're not precisely us. And you see how the brain and body weight of all of these animals are sort of in the same range. But here's an er another precursor of ours, Homo erectus, who did walk. And here's Homo sapiens, way up here. I mean, just a huge, huge jump. And here is the important consequence of that. Evolved human brains and minds support a culture. That's the collective sense in which we all share stories, songs, but we also build buildings and architecture. We have libraries. We have a whole wealth of culture that was created by human minds and brains, of course, interacting with the environment and working with the environment. But without that brain and mind, we wouldn't have the kind of culture. And we are one of the most social species of all. We absolutely depend on one another. We are needy of one another. We may think we would like to be off and free of all of the rest of the people around us, but think about it now how people can't even put their cell phone down for a couple of hours and be disconnected. That intense desire for sociality. And I dare say that if any of us were forced to be only with ourselves and our own thoughts, and maybe in a very nice place in a forest, for example, but no radios, no television, certainly, no communication, no newspapers, no books, nothing of any human being, by the end of the week, you would be mentally a little unbalanced. You would be going slightly crazy. Now, let's get back to wild times. Uh, they're to be expected in a dynamic universe, a universe that's changing with both genetic and cultural evolution. There's going to be some things got to give. Something's going to be wild. Now, here's a way to think about it. This is a kind of an analogy. 
uh, or a metaphor. An individual child grows and develops over a period of about 25 years. Well, if you think of humanity in an analogous way, humanity grows and develops, and it grows and develops, at least as far as our species goes, Homo sapiens, over about a million years. So here's an individual child, and here's the whole human race. A million years and about 25 years. And this is pretty interesting. Um, I wanted to just take a certain example of how culture uh, follows this rule of, first of all, having a certain pattern for all of humanity, and then a certain pattern for an individual child or human being. So here, whoops, here um, is 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago in human history, running along here. And up here, going this way, are the years of development of a child. Five years old, 10 years old, up to 25 years old. And this is the history of mathematics, which is surely a cultural thing. Basic arithmetic was in use by the Babylonians about 3,000 years ago. And then geometry comes into the ancient Greeks. We don't get algebra until 1,000 years ago. Pretty big jump. And then logarithms, the mechanics of Isaac Newton, differential geometry in Riemann, this is where Albert Einstein starts to come into the picture. There's a mathematical discipline called measure theory, which is sitting out here, and the set theory of George Cantor, which I spoke about many, many years ago about infinities and eternities. Um, so if you look at this, over here is the age when a child is kind of equipped to be able to understand this material. So at about five, children can start to understand the basic operations of arithmetic. Uh, 10 to 12 year olds, we start to get to be able to handle algebra. And then mechanics of Newton, you have to be in college, uh, and so on. So there is a correlation of how the whole human race acquired a cultural uh, capacity and how an individual being born grows and acquires that capacity. It's not, it's not, uh, I wouldn't make too much of this, but I think it's a helpful way to get a sense of when you were a child, nobody, you didn't know all along the way what was coming next. You had to enter into the world around you. You were attached to your mother so very closely for the first, first few months, and that was the universe that you experienced. And as you got a little older, like at the age of two, you began to be able to handle language, and, but you still didn't know what the full lay of the land was about. I used to think when I was a child, because I had a very large family of aunts and uncles, and so they were constantly coming and going, I thought as a child, when I was put to bed, that my father and mother and my aunts and uncles recreated the world for what it would be the next day. They like set the stage. So we finished this day, let's get the props out, let's put the things out on the lawn that are gonna be there, and let's, that they set it all up. Now maybe this came from the Santa Claus uh, set up. I don't know where it came from, but I had the sense that the reason the world is like it is because my parents made, and my aunts and uncles made it that way. But if you think of yourself as a two-year-old and you've got to figure things out, this is not unreasonable. So let's follow this a little bit. So over here, I want to look at an individual child. And over here is our humanity. So an individual child starts as an embryo. Then the child is born, nine months later. Humanity started from, I'm talking about homo sapiens now. We started from our primate ancestors and we split off from them and became homo sapiens. Now that took quite a number of million years. 
the child at about the age of two is starting to get some capacity for language. And we got language 70,000 years ago or so, could deal with the kind of complex language we use today. Obviously, it's advanced since then. But the basic structure to handle language in the nervous system, the pharynx, and the brain were falling into place 70,000 years ago. At about four years old, a child acquires what's called theory of mind. Now, that's a fancy word, but what it means is a child understands that other, that other people, adults, and other children have a mind like they do, and they think like they do. The child says, he doesn't say, he just begins to grasp it and know it. And it also becomes the basis for that's the first time that children can really be truly deceptive because they know you're going to think this and so they can do that and trick you. And of course human beings do this all the time. So, but that ability, before the age of four, children are literalists. They believe everything is exactly as it's supposed to be, as it's, as it's stated. Well, over here on the humanity side, about 2,500 years ago, we acquired the ability for analytical thought. And what that means is the ability to hold up something in your mind that is not the thing in itself and see it and take it apart in your mind and put it back together in your mind. Now, that is a very special capacity and it's the basis of analytical thought. And then finally, a child reaches adolescence. Now I'm calling it here loosely an age of discovery because it certainly is the discovery of sex in your own body, which is, I think, a valid discovery. It's also discovery of sex around you. But it's more than that. It's also the age at which you finally enter some capacity to see the world quite fully. And it's this time when you see how fallible adults are. How, in fact, what you thought and would trust it as the way the world is as described to you by your parents or your schooling or your church. The truth is, in some way, they don't really know for sure. They are dealing with the fact that the world is fundamentally mysterious. And you will face that fact, too. So, however, the age of discovery is the age that you discover the world is not quite as it seems. But that sets off an impulse to try to see, well, what, well, how is it really? If it's not quite as it seems and as it's been presented to me by the generations of the past, what is going on here? So it's a kind of impulse for exploration, an impulse for discovery, an impulse for inquiry and curiosity. And that's been going on most dramatically uh, for the last 300 years to the present. That takes us back to Galileo and Newton and the discovery of how the solar system really works and how the previous stories of how it worked were really very incomplete and in some ways complete, just basically wrong. Uh, and it comes all the way up to the present, certainly with uh, the discovery of evolution over a hundred years ago and its elaboration, the important advances that have been made in neuroscience, and the way the brain and mind work. All of this is part of an age of discovery, which is part of, which is a very big part of where we are right now. Now, I don't mean to say that discovery is the cause of uh, a kind of era of political chaos and wars and such like that. No, I'm not trying to make that connection. But I am saying it happens to be coming at the same time. I don't mean that it caused it, but it's present. 
And the age of discovery gives us some tools that we might find useful. It won't solve all our problems by any means, but it might be useful. So, back to the unstoppable forward motion of time and evolution. What that tells us, if you really get a hold of it, is that nothing is going to stay the same. It is going to move. It's going to change. It's changing under your feet. You may not want it to change. You may want to stay right where you are. But that's not the way the universe works. The universe is in motion. Now, it's been in motion very slowly over most of human history. So you can kind of more or less be like you always were and expect that your children will have essentially the same thing and their children after them and so on. But that's not the way it is. So there's an, an issue here that human beings are grappling with unconsciously. They're not thinking about evolution or the dynamism of the universe. They're just grappling with the realities that they see around them. But I'm trying to give you some kind of framework to locate what's going on and see if that isn't helpful, at least uh, <laughs> making things a little more peaceful. They make it a little more peaceful for me. So when you've got this progress, you, when you've got this evolutionary dynamic, this dynamic universe that is going to move, and everything's going to move, you can progress, that is, move forward into the unknown, and the unknown is scary. Or you can conserve, which is to say, no, I'm not going. I'm going to hang on to the present, and maybe even try to go back to the past. Now, both of these tendencies, I think, are natural. Because if you progress into the unknown unthoughtfully or um, without proper preparation, you could get into trouble. And conservative, the whole firm, is basically that instinct. Don't go there. Stay where you are right here. Let's keep doing it the way we've been doing it. Now, the only problem with that is the boat's moving under your feet. The river is carrying you on. You can't stay there. And so we have this tricky maneuver we somehow have to do, which is this boat's wearing out. It's starting to leak pretty badly. And we see a no new boat that is coming along but we don't know if it's all its pieces are there, and we also don't know if it will really work well as a boat, and we have to step out of this one and step into this one. It's a very tricky thing, and we can see it reflected in the turbulence of intellectual and political discourse at this time, because what he says, it's very hard, and it's slightly dangerous. But if you don't do it, you will also die that is, in, in, in the sense of the dynamism of the universe, you will be left behind. So, these are the topics that I thought we could go over uh, in this time of wildness, where you have to try to balance holding firm and going forward. The two some, certainly fundamental ones in the whole nature of evolution in the universe is the universe was born at one time, we were born at one time, we're going to die, and it's possible the universe is going to die also, only its death will be very different. It might actually simply go become a black hole, which is a kind of entry point into another universe. But we're not going there today. So birth and death, it seems to me, are very fundamental issues. And I want to spend the time on each of those in this series. Relationships, uh, I'm using that term rather than uh, mating or marriage, because this is one of the profound things that's changing. Uh, however, because of our sociality, 
We, not, we not only have to create new human beings, which is where birth comes from, and in the past, intimate relationships related to making babies involved mating systems that were very rigid and well-defined, and that's where the relationship was. The relationship was with husband and wife, or husband and his many wives, that's where the relationship was. But what's happened is making babies has separated itself from intimacy in our time, and that's one of the issues we'll try to see if we can't make some sense out of it. In this separation time, the I will, I will use the phrase evolution, but I'm using it loosely. The evolution of women, uh, mostly in the developed world, but it's spreading, it will go all over the world, is a very important phenomenon. And one of the driving forces behind it is for a woman to be able to make her own decisions and to be able to have some control over her fertility. Because that's not been something that women have ever had much control over. Because, first of all, women, men had most of the control, and there just wasn't the technology to do it. Across over here, if we get beyond the pair bond and talk about the bonds that we all share together in a society, the evolution of civil society, I think, is a very important topic and it has a lot to do with violence. Because the way societies in our species, I am sad to say, the way societies evolved fundamentally involved violence. Where one controlling gang of powerful males, perhaps led by a king or a leader, basically challenged another ruling group, defeated them, and took over until someone came along and did the same thing to them. What's happening in Syria right now is exactly a continuation of that form of governance. Even into this modern time, it's still present in some parts of the world. But hunter-gatherers were still present in some parts of the world until 50 years ago. They're now just about all assimilated. But 50 and 100 years ago, you could still find hunter-gatherer tribes, which go back to the kind of existence we had for the first couple hundred thousand years. So, um, another thing that's really quite important and plays a role in the dynamics of this turbulent time is religion. And I would like to also say something about the relationships between science and religion. So we'll have a uh, talk on that. Uh, another important thing is information in the, in global society. Now what I mean by that is one of the things that has uh, bound people together in the past is the limited amount of contact they have with other people. When you were in a tribe, you were in your tribe, and you bumped against the tribes that were near you, and you may have had some traders who would go off and come back, but mostly you stayed put. Uh, so you didn't know what other people far away were thinking, and for the most part, you saw them as threats. Those people far away were a threat to you. Uh, with the information revolution in global society, these are dramatically changing, and I think they have important uh, impacts on uh, what is coming next in the way of how we can civilly live with one another, uh, have a fruitful existence, cooperate with other people rather than aggressively uh, deal with them, and information and sharing information with others that leaps over your local tribe and what they want you to believe, or your local country and what they want you to believe and how they want you to behave, to connecting with people in another country who are also facing the same situation with their controlling government. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the impact on openness, transparency, uh, freedom of information, these are all important issues that are going to come forward with the development of the internet and global information. So, uh, and 
one planet. A lot of people are very upset if they see something like that. What are you talking about? The United Nations is going to come in here and take us over this kind of talk. It's very foolish talk. There is a certain sense in which we are all in this together because of the global warming situation, because of the overpopulation problem. This planet is, in some sense, the home of everyone, not just one country or one nation. And we have to develop a way of understanding that and responding to it fruitfully rather than letting the river move forward and we're staying back here and we therefore perish. And finally, I wanted to say something about death and in particular about dying, which it seems to me is going to be more of an important consideration in our hot technology era. That is dying, how we do it. So that would be final talk. So now, I want to take about a two or three minute break. If you want to use the restroom, you can, but I just, I don't want us to drift far apart. I just want to have a little break here. But before I do it, I wanted to read a little excerpt of a poem by James Agee. And when we come back, sorry, I'm confusing so many things here. We're going to take a break. We're going to, I'm going to read a poem. We're going to take a break. And then I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about birth. So, if you think about when you were a child, when we were all children, and we were just coming to sort of see what's going on here, just trying to figure out who we are, because we did, I think most of us do finally see that the parents, the parents don't know what's going on exactly. And so, you are just emerging into trying to, and becoming aware of a much bigger world. Now James Agee has written a wonderful poem about this and actually has been set to a very wonderful piece of music by Samuel Barber. The title of the poem is Knoxville, 1918. I don't know if some of you do, any of you know this poem? Well, oh, oh, this is just an excerpt from it. It's set on a summer night in Knoxville, Tennessee. The nice sounds and the warmth of the summer and neighbors and yards and it's evening and here's where the poem picks up. On the rough wet grass of the backyard, my father and mother have spread quilts. We all lie there, my mother, my father, my uncle, my aunt, and I too am lying there. They are not talking much. And the talk is quiet, of nothing in particular, of nothing at all in particular, of nothing at all as far as I can tell. The stars are wide and alive. They seem each like a smile of great sweetness, and they seem very near. All my people are larger bodies than mine, with voices gentle and meaningless like the voices of sleeping birds. One is an artist, he is living at home. One is a musician, and she is living at home. One is my mother, who is good to me. One is my father, who is good to me. By some chance, here they are, all on this earth. And who shall ever tell the sorrow of being on this earth? lying on quilts on the grass in a summer evening among the sounds of the night. May God bless my people, my uncle, my aunt, my mother, my good father. Oh, remember them kindly in their time of trouble and in the hour of their taking away. So, about two or three minutes, just, just a slight break. In fact, you can all just sort of stay put. If you want me to just plunge right on, I'll do that. But I just wanted to draw a line between this introduction and where we're going next. Should I just go on? Okay. Birth. 
So, when it comes to birth in our time, here are some, here are the basic questions. How and where to grow eggs? Whose eggs? Whose sperm? What kind of eggs to grow? And who decides? Now, what I think is important here is that these are not these were never questions. How and where to grow eggs? What are you talking about? They just grow naturally. It's done. Whose eggs? Well, the woman's eggs. Whose sperm? It's the man's eggs who impregnates her. What kind of eggs to grow? What kind are there? How many kinds are there? That's all there is. And who decides? Well, sometimes they have trouble deciding. That's true. But somehow, eventually, a decision gets made, and she's pregnant. So, but now, all of these are questions. And I'm going to add one more question. Who's mitochondria? And you're saying, what the heck are you talking about? Who's mitochondria? I'll explain that, in fact, it's possible for a child to have three parents, because the mitochondria would come from one, and the sperm and the egg come from the other two. And you could have a contribution of all three. Now, the mitochondria is a small organelle in the cell. It's a very important part of the body. But it has its own DNA. It reproduces separately from what's called the nuclear DNA, which is the major DNA strand which most of the proteins and regulation of the cell are built from. The mitochondria has its own, has its own reproductive machinery. And that's why you can have mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA. Well, let's, let's take a look at this. Um, where the baby gets made is now not so simple because of the technology of in vitro fertilization in which eggs are manipulated and sperm is manipulated. Now this originally arose because of fertility problems. Uh, the two principal problems are that it's not uncommon for women to have blocked fallopian tubes, but otherwise the ova that they have are perfectly okay, but the tubes are not working right. The second one is on the male side. It's about sperm. Now, for reasons that nobody can understand or fully get a grip on, and in fact, there's some controversy about the data, it appears that there's a worldwide decline in the potency of male sperm. So where males typically will ejaculate millions of sperm, in some cases, some men only have a dozen. So that's a problem. So one of the ways of getting around this is to extract an egg, get a bunch of sperm accumulated over several different tries, and try to get them together and impregnate them. But you can see that this opens the door, so to speak, to what else can you do? Now, one of the things they found was that it's very difficult to get the egg that's been fertilized properly, gets fertilized, it's very difficult to implant that egg if you wait too long. It doesn't, you can't let it keep dividing. The, the, the single cell that's been fertilized divides, and then they divide, and they divide, and it grows like topsy. So it, it doesn't implant well if you wait, so you have to, have to get it into the womb. So in this case, the womb is still the place. We are nowhere near any kind of situation where you could grow a baby in an artificial womb. But I'm sure some people might like to think about that. The other important thing that's going on is what's called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD. Now this also arose because of problems um, of particularly genetic diseases that you can detect in the embryo. So
Some of these are, there's a thing called Fragile X Syndrome. There is uh, Tay-Sachs disease, which is a very debilitating disease in which a child who has te carrying Tay-Sachs or has it expressed uh, will probably not live past the age of four. Uh, and there are a number of other genetic diseases. And so if you have parents who are carrying dominant genes for both, who are carrying genes for both, for both carrying the genes for a particular disease, the way genetics works, that gives a one in four chance of having the gene expressed, which means one out of four children, if it's at random, would have the disease. So it's a very high risk situation. I don't think anybody would like to put a gun to their head that has four bullets in it. You don't know whether it's loaded or not. So one of the things you can do is take the fertilized eggs. Of course, you need seven, you need quite a few. And then you can examine them to see if that gene is present. And if the gene is not present, then you can implant the egg back and a child will grow. Um, I think this is a good point to bring in um, the way in which, for example, uh, some strands of society are enormously upset about these reproductive technologies. And I don't think these technologies get a, get a kind of blank check of approval by any means. But there are some people who say it's all completely wrong. God makes babies. People don't make babies. Keep your hands off of it. Let God, if God wants to give you a child with tie sacks who's going to suffer for four years and then die, that's God's business. Um, there's an interesting story of an evangelical Christian couple who in fact were carriers of Tysex. They didn't know it, but their first child actually was born with the disease. And they suffered through that child's life. And they also knew that this, the idea of taking an egg and studying it to see if it carried the disease and putting it back in the womb sounded like a horrible thing to them because their uh, religious beliefs were totally against anything like that. And after some time of thinking about it, and they very much wanted a child, another child. And there were other examples of people who had done this and had successfully implanted an embryo that did not carry Tysax. They decided to go ahead with it against their religion. And it was successful, and they were thankful. Now, um, I think that's perhaps a little unusual. I think people who are very, the way, the way changes of attitude normally take place is um, the older generation dies off, and a new generation comes forward that doesn't have those attitudes quite so deeply implanted. Um, so genetic disease screening is one of the ways that this PGD is used. But it leads now to, well, we can also tell what sex that embryo is going to be. So do you want to choose which sex you want to have? Well, a lot of people do. And I think this is somewhat worrisome myself, but uh, gender choice then becomes a possibility. But then the door really opens uh, or, well, let me just say one other thing. Uh, oh, I see I made a typo error here in the file. I pasted in a word that's not supposed to be there. Uh, what this slide is supposed to say is that IVF and PGD, the two technologies I just talked about, are privileges of wealth. That is, it costs anywhere from 20000 to $500,000 to do the series of treatments that need to be done. And it's not, it's not a uh, piece of cake. A woman has to take quite a heavy dose of different hormones to get her to produce a sufficient number of eggs uh, 
So there's a lot of lab work. There's a, you know, there's a whole industry that's built up around this. But it is an industry that is an industry for wealthy people. So beyond IVF and PGD looms the idea of genetic design, which is, well, what else can we uh, choose? Uh, can we make, we can make people taller, we can make them stronger, and we can probably change their brains and nervous systems. Now, I just want to say that in some sense, this kind of uh, manipulation of offspring is something I have going on all around me. I am growing grapes that are French-American hybrids that were crossed between Native American grapes of several different kinds of species with European grapes so that they could have the cold hardiness and disease resistance of American grapes in the American climate and they could have the wine quality of European grapes. All of the fruit trees I have are hybrids that were gotten by crossing different species. Now there was no manipulating embryos, but it was simply done by breeding, by which in the case of human beings, you could get different effects by the particular choices of individuals you have who mate together. That would be the equivalent thing. But this is a step beyond. This is where we say, well, we're not, oh, let me just back up and say that in the case of plant breeding, you basically take, plants never breed true particularly. Nothing actually breeds completely true. So you take a couple, of, you take these two trees and they have the characteristics you want. So you crossbreed them. And then you get, in the case of peaches or nectarines, you get a thousand pits out of it. You plant a thousand pits and you wait till they grow up and you see what kind of disease resistance they have and how tasty the fruit is. And out of those thousand trees, you may get four or five that you then will recross and keep trying to breed. And let me just mention that the, all the breeds of dogs that are around us are descendants of the gray wolf. They all come from just one species. And yet, by the crossbreeding that took place, we got, you know, everything from St. Bernard's to um, little nothings. Um, and that's just done by breeding. There are some people who, I think, right, I think rightfully so, we're getting a little, we get a little nervous about even breeding. But the idea of actually manipulating the genome is, uh, perhaps even much more disturbing. And I think it's appropriate that it's disturbing. On the other hand, I don't think it's going to go away because we have moved ourselves along and found out how to breed so many other things. And, um, but I, I do have an important point to make about this, and it does have to do with evolution. Genetic design, the idea of designing something, of designing a baby, you want it to be tall and smart, beautiful, I don't know, you have your design criteria. Versus evolution, well, that's not how evolution works. Evolution doesn't work that way at all. Ev evolution works with random mutations, just random changes. And then natural selection works on those changes and discards some and keeps some that go on. So genetic design is really very contrary to evolution. I don't mean that it's wrong or it shouldn't be done, but it's, it's operationally very different from how we got here. There is a very important way, remember I talked about art and how art is this combination of laws about the things that you can determine and something that is spontaneous, something that is an accident, something that is mysterious. That makes the best art. 
So the idea of designing the genome is contrary to the greatest art. That is, to really totally design it. I mean, that doesn't mean artists, for example, will use things about the lawfulness of how pigments work and what you can do with them and how you can manipulate them. That's, that's part of, of, their, of their work. And evolution works with lawful behavior. The laws of physics are there guiding things along. But there is a mysterious and free element as well. And perhaps people who think about genetic design haven't thought through that it's actually somewhat contrary to the way evolution works. So genetic design has this intention of what I want to do, but there is surprise and accident that is fundamental to everything that has vitality and excitement and great wonder in life. Uh, I just mentioned in passing that at the same time people are thinking of genetically designing the human genome, it's interesting to know what's going on in engineering right now. One of the very fast growing fields is genetic design. But they're doing it like evolution, not like design. Because engineering before was all design. Want to make a jet engine? Well, here are the laws of fluid motion. Here's the laws of how steel breaks and bends. And you use all these laws and all the physics of how this works. You say, well, I want the blade to go this fast, and it's going to stress that much. And it's all worked out from the analysis of the laws. There are some very powerful design algorithms now that companies like uh, United Aircraft and Pratt and & Whitney and General Electric that don't go that way at all. They put the laws in that you have to respect. You can't violate the laws of physics. But that doesn't, if I, if I give you the laws of physics and said, get the jet engine out of it, you can't possibly do it because the laws are a constraint on something that's created. And then they have simulated biology. So they, they have the genome of the jet engine. And, and then they randomly change some of the genes. And they see what kind of jet engine comes out of that genome. And they let the jet engines interact with each other that come out. One that's a little lighter wins the contest. One that's a little more efficient wins the contest. And they let the jet engines go through natural selection until finally one comes out. And actually, these, these design projects using genetic algorithms, they're called, actually do better than human designers. Uh, people who have, you know, who are, are still trying to explain how evolution couldn't possibly be right, it's completely wrong, there's no design. Uh, there's still a couple of act very active people who are are struggling against this. And when, when, they, when, you talk, when they talk about that, you say, well, you know, it turns out that random mutation plus natural selection works better for human design projects like jet engines. So the very process that nature uses actually works better than so-called intelligent design. Um, well, maybe I'll just say one word. Uh, because this sort of leads to, you know, what do we make of all of this? Now, there are two important books. One that's very important because it's got an important history. Brave New World by Aldous Huxley was published in the 1950s. Has anybody ever read Brave New World, or do you know about it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Brave New World basically paints a fairly dark and um, portrait of the future in which is full of vanity and drugs and sex that, uh, and uh, a kind of caste system where babies are put together, are created for different functions and class levels. It's, it's a very um, unhappy novel. 
And a modern author, Margaret Atwood, who's one of whose books I'm reading right now, Craig and Oris, is part of a trilogy. She's not written the third one yet. It's also about a dystopic, a dysfunctional dystopic, you know, not a utopia, but a dystopia uh, future. Um, and uh, I think these books are very good books. They're very interesting. But it seems to me that the dystopic picture of the future is a little distorted, that it somehow doesn't bring in the surprise and the accident that can happen that is beneficent, not just malevolent. And these are somewhat missing, I think, from the dystopic <coughs> literature. But it's not a literature I'm deeply familiar with, so I could be wrong about that. So my final thoughts is, do go, because you have to go. This is a dynamic universe. But go slowly and be wise. So, thank you. That's all I have to say right now. We can uh, have some questions, I guess. Or comments, or Can I just comment about your design. Yes, a little Listen, louder. A little louder. You're talking about design. No, I don't need that. Well, okay, you're talking about design. Doesn't quite leave room for the fact that there's always unexpected consequences. That is, it can't take over. Design mm -hmm. cannot mm -hmm. take the place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of surprise. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, I think that's true. Any other comments or questions? You talk about the individuals sort of engineering their uh, offspring, but what really gets scary, I think, is when governments get into that, like uh, well, back during Woodrow Wilson's era, back during uh, Hitler, about using these techniques in order to create new populations, uh, to en enhance your your people mm -hmm. over other peoples mm -hmm. of the world. Is that idea kind of gone away now, or is that still always a threat? I, I would guess everything is kind of still around and on the table, uh, and people are going to think the thoughts they want. I have a couple of comments about, about um, the, the Nazi era, for example. Um, the genocide is part of our legacy. When Genghis Khan swept across all of uh, Central Asia and into a large swath of China. The Mongols would attack a city like the city of Mur or Samarkand, these great cities. These were Islamic cities at the time. And see, lay siege to it. And once they got the city to uh, capitulate, they would gather all the men together and execute them. And something on the scale of a few thousand men would be executed in an afternoon by the Mongol soldiers. There is an eyewitness account of this by a very good historian, Persian historian. Uh, and then the Mongols would take uh, all of the women of reproductive age as their own wives. They would also get rid of old women, children, especially boy children. So uh, this is not a modern invention. The idea of advancing your genes against other genes. In fact, the, the, the residue of that is still with us. Uh, a really important study that was done in the last 10 years, there are now several like it, studied the genome of Oh, something on the scale of 8,000 men from all across Europe and China. 
the areas where the Mongols have been. And they also had uh, genome information from the concentrated Mongol territory itself. And the conclusion is that something like one out of 11 men is a direct descendant of Genghis Khan. So um, maybe we don't want to live that way. Maybe we don't want to live with war all the time is the way we change governments. That's how we came to be where we are right now. And it's only through some very painful uh, changes that took place in the last two or three hundred years that we have elections and men who are in power willingly leave it when they lose the election. This is a very powerful and very important change. The human race didn't know how to do that. We don't know how to do that. And in many countries that have a certain amount of democracy, it's very rigged for the most part, and the dominant party and the gang that's in charge is going to try to keep its power and not relinquish it even when people don't want them anymore. Because they want to be in power. So um, some of the unpleasant things, uh, the really malevolent things that human beings do, is, I am sad to say, what the novelist George Eliot called some of Mother Nature's nasty habits. And we human beings have some very nasty habits we have to learn to drop and hopefully some much better habits to take on instead. Well, thank you, thank you. I think there's some little snacks and if you wanna socialize a little bit, I guess we can do that.